Tonight, the judge presiding over the federal criminal case against Donald Trump and his attempts to subvert the 2020 election, Judge Tanya Chutkin, denied Trump's request that she recuse herself from that case. We are still awaiting her ruling on special counsel Jack Smith's request for a limited gag order to be imposed on Trump. Meanwhile, prosecutors in the Georgia case against Trump and 18 other defendants are raising concerns about the defense. Today, Fulton County DA Fani Willis asked the judge to issue a protective order on discovery materials, citing concerns over previous instances of doxing. The DA noted both in this filing and over the weekend that her own personal information was leaked, including the home addresses of multiple family members. Joining me now is Melissa Redman, former Fulton County Deputy District Attorney. Melissa, thanks for being here. I now officially think an MSNBC contributor. I am. Thank you. Um, first off, the request for a protective order. Um, discovery materials have already been shared. Mm -hmm. Is it strange or in any way unusual to ask for a protective order after the materials have already been shared with the defense? It is. You would expect that protective order to have been filed when the discovery was turned over, especially considering we saw in the hearing where they talked about, I haven't gotten discovery yet, I'm giving it to you today, we haven't gotten to the deadline yet, yeah. um, that the state talked about needing a protective order, needing to protect that information. And that was almost a month ago. Yeah. So uh, we saw the, maybe it was the protective order for the jurors that yeah. may have prompted them to remember that they didn't actually file. Oh, oops. <laughs> the, the protective order for the discovery. Um, there may have been something that came out that was only in discovery and wasn't publicly available that could have prompted them to say, well, we really need to file this order to protect any further information from being disseminated. What is clear is that D.A. Willis wants to bubble wrap as much as possible, given the unprecedented nature of threats and harassment. She and her family members protect, you know, grand jury members, the right. doxing. It's extraordinary. Um, do you, is, I mean, I would assume there's obviously a risk in acti asking for a protective order after the material's already gone out, right? Right. Well, it's, it will still protect the material that hasn't been made publicly available yeah. yet. Right. And so there hasn't been a lot that's been disclosed that we know of from any of the parties involved. And so it will still protect that in the individual. Judge McAfee can say, well, everything that you've gotten from discovery, keep it to yourself. It's only for you to prepare for your defense. It's not for public dissemination. It's not for you to comment on the credibility of the witnesses, who the witnesses are. Yeah. We don't want them to be harassed or intimidated, um, affecting their testimony at the eventual trial. When we talk about some of the witness intimidation and the evidence at hand, um, Rolling Stone is reporting, and I will f just flag that these are some unnamed sources, that Trump is hoping to suppress the, the submission of the infamous phone call uh, with Brad Raffensperger as part of the evidence in the, the in D.A. Willis's case. Um, he's effectively saying, and this again is according to Rolling Stone's reporting, which NBC News has not independently confirmed, that he's saying the taping of that phone call was illegal. Mm -hmm. That he, Florida, uh, th there was some taping in Florida and in Florida... It's a two-party state, which effectively means the taper and the tapee both have to give their consent. Right. Is there a world in which Fonnie Willis won't be able to use the Brad Raffensperger phone call where Trump asks him to find 11,790 votes? Possibly. So if the court does determine that that phone call was unlawfully taped, it was a violation of Trump's expectation of privacy, then they could, um, the court could determine that it shouldn't be used against him. A couple of things that the... DA could argue, one, the state was not a party to that recording. Right. Georgia, was, the state right. was not doing that. It was a third party recording. So if you think of someone on their own acting um, as a, a party to a criminal conspiracy. Event, a conspiracy, and then one of them tells, uh, or one of them turns over evidence of that conspiracy to the state, does that mean that the state can't use it? Hmm. The other thing is that even in Florida, you have to have an expectation of privacy. So if you that conversation takes place in a circumstance where the person doesn't have an expectation of privacy, um, then the state could argue that it's an exception to that two-party rule in Florida, if, in fact, it was recorded in Florida. The expectation of privacy, I would assume you expect a phone call to be private when it's you and me right. chatting. But if it's you, me, and, like, seven campaign officials, a couple lawyers, and some people down in the Georgia Secretary of State's office, exactly. including, like, paralegals and whatnot, right. is there an expectation of privacy there? That would be the argument. That would be the argument the state would make, that there was no expectation of privacy. So even if 
the conversation was recorded in Florida, a two-party state, then the state would argue they should still be allowed to use it as tri in, in evidence in the trial. Um, I got to ask, just because we're still waiting to hear about whether Jeffrey Clark and the three fake electors are going to be allowed to move their case to federal court, mm -hmm. how do you, where, where's the strength of that movement at this point as you see it? Well, it's, it's interesting because we a thought that Meadows had the strongest argument. Yeah. And it's been about a week or so since that case was heard by Judge Jones. Um, and so I think everybody anticipated that his ruling would come down a lot faster. And we're about at the same time frame, a few more days. And we think we'll be right about that 10 days um, that it took him to deliver the, his decision in the Meadows case. Yeah. But I think it is a, a arguing that I'm an alternate elector and not a fake elector, and I was performing a federal function, makes it a federal, makes me a federal agent, is a long shot. Uh, long shot. Okay, yeah. from your, your mouth to uh, the judge's ears, Melissa Redman, <laughs> welcome and thank, thank you for you. your time.